Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and today's episode, we are going to be talking about major changes to Amazon and how they are going to affect you. So you want to stay tuned for this because this affects every single Amazon seller. We're going to talk about some facts. We're going to talk about some newly revealed items on Amazon, some old stuff that's been revamped, and then some new things that you can expect going in into Q4, which is coming up faster than you think. And speaking of Q4, last week on the Q4 Jumpstart class was off the chain. It was. All the students learned a ton of stuff about Q4, what to send in, how to sell, where to sell it, when to send it in, when the pricing strategies are really important for Q4, and all the different events and holidays. A uh, hint, it's not just Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. There are many other events and things to capitalize on during Q4, and they all the students learned that in the Q4 Jumpstart class. There is still time to get the replay of the live class, plus all the downloads, the calendar, the notes, the everything that comes with that. Mommyincome.com slash jumpstart. You only have a few weeks left to be able to grab Q4 Jumpstart class. It is not too late, but you've got to be able to take action now. So don't forget about the Q4 Jumpstart class, especially if this is your first Q4, you're new to selling, or you had a Q4 last year, but you weren't happy with it, or you weren't um, sure what the heck you were doing. That's perfectly okay. We all start as a beginner somewhere. So I want to make sure that you're prepared for that. Mommyincome.com slash jumpstart and you can get the Q4 jumpstart class there. Okay, so I'm going to give you some brief overview about what Amazon has recently announced that they are doing. And I know I talked to you guys about whether or not this is good or bad. Change is always hard. Let's just be real. Change can be positive, but it's always difficult to make an adjustment. I don't know about you, but I am kind of change averse. I don't really love a lot of change because it just creates a lot of stress. We have to learn new things. We have to do new things. It's not always going to be the same. And ugh, that kind of causes stress and overwhelm and pain and money sometimes. And so we want to talk about what's going on with the changes at Amazon. So what's going, what is Amazon doing currently? So as of July 13th, Amazon has made this announcement about what they are doing in, um, what they have been doing over the 2020, including COVID-19 and coronavirus issues and things like that. They're investing 30 billion, hello, who has $30 billion? Amazon, Jeff Bezos, you know, into new facilities. They're opening 33 new fulfillment centers in 20. 2020. Wow. That's a lot. 33 fulfillment centers. Now, what does this mean for you? Um, it's good and bad. Let's be honest. Uh, it's good because more fulfillment centers equal um, probably some closer to you, uh, different fulfillment centers for different products and product types. So you might actually save a little bit of money on shipping and save time. Time sometimes is worth more than money. you got a great product and you're trying to get it back on the shelves and you're restocking and Amazon's taking 10, 12, 15 days to not only receive it, but put it into stock, that hurts your bottom line. So more facilities mean probably faster processing, faster fulfillment, and that's great news for us sellers, right? And also Amazon, what? Oh wait, I forgot about the bad news. Okay, the bad news is when new fulfillment centers open up, they have new training, they have new equipment issues, they have, you know, they're just all getting acclimated to a new process and system, although their systems are, are very standardized among all of the different fulfillment centers and they use a lot of the products and everything else. But the reality is that new employees equal a uh, margin of error, you know? And so because of the margin of error, that means slower check-in times for some of these newer warehouses. That means more mistakes up front and at first. So brace yourself. That's just the truth about what's happening. So just want to make sure that you understand that. Um, if you're going to, if the new fulfillment center opens up and you see a new code coming up in your shipping plan, um, just know that Amazon is trying to train new people. 175,000 new employees have been hired in the last three months. That is a lot of employees. That means a lot of training. That means a lot of people are new. So give a little bit of grace give yourself some extra time to restock or stock inventory because mistakes may be made and be ready to prove if a shipment is lost, an item is lost. Be ready to prove what you sent in with your invoices and all those things just in case there's a lost shipment. Because if there's a lost shipment, you have to prove what was in it and where you bought it and when so that they can reimburse you for the lost inventory. 
Okay, another th fact that Amazon just revealed to us in the past couple of weeks is more than 50% of the units sold on Amazon are sold by third party sellers. That's a big stat, fit more than, they didn't say the exact number, but they said more than 50% of the units sold are from people like me and you. So Amazon is moving more towards third party sellers. And I've got some other fun facts for you. So that's just some facts that Amazon has told us in the past um, couple of weeks and the things that they're doing to maximize capacity. This came in a news bulletin. You can look at Seller Central and look at the news bulletins and read it for yourself. But they're trying to let us know that they are preparing for the holiday season. They know they have the lion's share of online retail sales during Q4 and they want to make sure that everyone's getting their stuff on time. That Amazon is customer centric. Did you not know this? So they want to make sure that people are getting their stuff on time. They're hiring new drivers. They're buying new vehicles to be able to deliver things a lot faster and different. They're um, just upping their game to make sure that they can keep up the Amazon Prime standard that they charge us all money for. So good for that. Now here's some other fun facts. I don't know if you like fun facts. I don't even know if they're fun, but I'll tell you what it means and what I think it means for us as sellers. So according to Bloomberg Law, and in an article pertaining to an antitrust lawsuit filed against Amazon in March of 2020, um, there are 2 million registered third-party sellers on Amazon. 2 million. So for those of you like, oh my gosh, is it saturated? Are there too many sellers? Is there still room for me? There's plenty of room. There's plenty of room, 2 million. How many of those are active? Probably not as many, probably less than, I would, I would gather to say less than 500,000 of those registered third party sellers are actually actively selling on a regular basis. So the act, if you, if you look at that and how many products Amazon actually sells on a daily basis, how many things are listed on all that kind of stuff, um, it's actually a lot smaller than you realize, but there's just some other interesting stats that you need to know. Amazon is responsible for 49% of US online retail sales. This is not a shock, but it's a high number. That's almost half, hence the reason why the antitrust laws are coming out. Because if anyone owns half or more of a particular product, a particular um, you know, monopoly, if you will, on something, the government doesn't like that. Customers don't like that. Customers don't like the fact that Amazon is trying to take over the world. And if you are um, not believing that Jeff Bezos and his fun family at Amazon is trying to take over the world, um, you've got your head in the sand. Because that's literally, I think, his life goal is to like take over the world. I think he's got a God complex, just saying. Anyway, but this is the most interesting thing and why it's important to us. 68% of total sales on Amazon are by third party sellers like you and me. This is a big deal. And the reason this is a big deal is because Amazon is more and more dependent and becoming more dependent on us third party sellers to bring products, new products, different products, variety of products to the Amazon marketplace. Because of these antitrust laws and all these lawsuits that are coming up against Amazon being a monopoly and having unfair, unfair pricing strategies and things like that, um, they are more heavily relying on third party sellers like you and I to provide products to the Amazon marketplace. So that is actually good news. And the reason it's good news is because they're going to start supporting us a little bit more. They're going to make, a, we hope, at least they're taking some steps. The jury's still out on this one, but we'll see. They're going to try to take steps to reduce some of the stuff, and I'll get to that in a minute. They're, Amazon's under fire with all of these lawsuits and all of these different things because of the massive data that they collect. So they are collecting data constantly. I don't know if you know it, but Amazon's not just a marketplace. They are a global data collection agency and it gives them a competitive advantage. Here's an example. When Amazon could hypothetically observe a spike in, um, I don't know, like water bottle sales, okay? And because of that, they can create their own private label product and make the product, create it, and sell it for about half the cost. And of course, promote their listing to the top. 
because they're the top dog and they can do whatever they want. So even though you have a sponsored ad, even though you have the best listing on Amazon, they can still place their listing number one. They can run free ads. They can target people that are looking for water bottles and sell their water bottle to those customers. That is a complete unfair competitive advantage that they have and because of that they are being sued multiple by multiple places multiple companies and the government and the federal trade commission is looking into amazon so just be aware of that they do have a competitive advantage but after all these lawsuits and scrutinies or some last july um, that they were you know were investigated for some of the stuff and they promised to make changes which they have not which is why they're under another lawsuit that's going to be a huge deal um, going forward so, but this is what Amazon is doing about it as of July 2020. Even though it's July, this is a direct quote from Amazon Seller Central. Even though it's July, we're preparing early for the holiday season to meet sustained increased demand. We have already reduced our own retail product offerings and orderings to accommodate for more of your products and help you continue to see sales growths. Right before that, Amazon was um, bragging, if you will, about um, third-party sellers have record sales during COVID. Well, duh. I mean, everyone's not going to stores. Where are they going to buy stuff? Where's the only store in the world that has everything? Amazon. They have groceries. They have toilet paper. They have hand sanitizer. They have masks. They have everything that you need. They have homeschool supplies. They have all the stuff that we need. And so Amazon has told us specifically quoted right here, that they're reducing how many products they're selling as a seller so that we can sell more products as third party sellers. Well, thank you. I guess that's really nice. So what does this mean for us? That means that there's more room for our products. Amazon is going to be selling less product themselves. That means we compete with Amazon a lot less. That means Amazon is innovating different ways to make more money. Cause you think they're just going to be like, Oh, well, I guess we'll stop selling products because we keep getting sued. And instead they're just investing their income and their money and their billions and billions of dollars in other things. Have you heard of the Amazon dash cart? This is like a brand new thing where Amazon has this dash cart. It's, it's going up a uh, beta is going to be going up in LA, I think pretty soon where it's this shopping cart that's linked to your Amazon cart so that obviously they can track the product, but you don't even have to scan it in. You don't have to do anything. As soon as you put it in the cart, Amazon knows what it is. I don't know if it's a barcode thing. I don't know what happens. I don't know the exact process, but it knows how much you're putting in the cart. It automatically adds it to your checkout. And then you have to, I, I don't know, like walk by a kiosk. There's no cashiers at this. This is all self-serve grocery, but you don't even have to go through a line. So literally you could buy and bag your groceries at the same time and basically walk out of the store and it's already linked to your Amazon account and pay. But this also gives Amazon all of your grocery buying data too. So if you want that, great. But they are innovators. They are constantly innovating, which is why there's constant change on Amazon. But it means that they're going to start shifting their focus on other ways to generate income and innovate products and innovate software and things like that, which also means less competition product-wise for us third-party sellers. So I think this is great news. No one likes to compete with Amazon. It's like David and Goliath. I mean, can we really compete against Amazon the giant? This is why Target and Walmart and some of these other places are involved in these antitrust laws because they feel Amazon has this unfair data advantage, which they do. And because of their ties with Google and other things, they're dominating the information space, which also limits what other people can see if they choose to do so. That's a whole nother episode we could talk about. But because of the antitrust suits, the fines, the global scrutiny of the monopolization of online retail sales, they're working in our favor and Amazon is backing down on directly competing product-wise. That's great. That is really great news for us. That means that there's just more more of the piece of the pie for us to take as uh, product sellers. I think Amazon's gonna continue slowly um, being able to not reducing their own inventory so that we can sell more inventory. So I think that's a really good move. I think it's a good move on their part because if they continue to try to have this unfair advantage, the government will eventually shut them down somehow, some way. But you know, people with millions and billions and billions of dollars money talks, right? So 
Um, I, I don't, I don't care what they say. Even some of these antitrust people, you know, they all have Amazon accounts. Don't even lie. Don't even lie and tell me you don't order on Amazon because you know you do. They just want it to be fair for us. So I'm glad there's a Federal Trade Commission. I'm glad these lawsuits are coming up because it will help us as third party sellers. All right, next issue we want to talk about that Amazon has revealed and is going to start enforcing very soon is inventory limits. Now, let me reiterate that this is not a new thing. The inventory limits come with the IPI scores, the inventory performance index, such as IPI. And we all have this on our inventory dashboard. You can see it when you log into Seller Central. If you go to in your inventory dashboard, you will see this nice little color coded is pink all the way to green. And it'll give you a score. And what that score means is how your inventory is performing. What is your sell through rate? How many units do you have that are, that are aging, old stock? You're getting a lot of fees. What is Amazon doing about that? They said that this is another quote from Seller Central. We're working to manage inventory performance to ensure all products have space available during peak times. To enable this, we are changing the IPI minimum threshold requirement to 500. Sellers below 500 will be subject to limits effective August 16th, 2020. That's right around the corner, people, through the end of the year. So Amazon is letting us know that 500 or more is the target for your IPI score. If your score is below that, there are definitely things you can do, but there's two things you need to know. Number one, there are no appeals on this, these limits. If Amazon says you can only send in 10 of a product, that's all you get. You cannot request for more. It says there will be no requests accepted for these limits. So you need to be aware of that. What about new listings? What if you are creating a new listing? Hello, we're creating bundles all the time. What does this mean for new listings? They will initially have quantity limitations in order to build sales and that will go up as sales go up. That was according to Amazon and their help. So IPI, your in in inventory performance index. So what can you do if your score is below 500? There's a couple things. Number one, remove or sell off slow moving inventory. What Amazon is doing is they don't want your slow moving inventory to just be sitting there all the time. It's taking up space that could be, could be for products that are moving faster, hence making them money, hence making everybody else money. So they don't want your slow movers there. This is one of the reasons they started implementing more often a long-term storage fee that they're charging on a regular basis. They don't want slow moving inventory. They don't want to be your storage unit. To be honest, they don't. And honestly, it's not fair for them. They don't have to do that. You're in business to sell inventory. So sell inventory. If it's not moving, here's what you can do next. You can remove slow selling inventory for free starting July 14th to question mark. We don't know. They didn't give an end date. They said a limited duration and they will notify us by email when it will end. So it's from July 14th till whenever they decide. So that could be in a week, that could be in two months. We don't know what that is. So what you need to do is sell or create a removal order for your inventory. And so July 14th and on, you can remove all your stuff for free. That means Amazon will pick it up, ship it to you, back to your house or dispose of it for absolutely zero cost. So think about your monthly storage fees, what you're paying on this slow inventory and decide if it's worth it to have it recalled and maybe try to revamp the listing or um, if it's a seasonal thing, you can just keep it at home or something like that until then or dispose of it completely because it's just not worth your time and effort. So your options are to um, send it back to yourself or somewhere else or you can create the removal order and or, or dispose of it so amazon will just take it and do what they will now remind you that if they quote unquote dispose of it for you um they can keep it and resell it if they want to that's part of their terms and conditions when it comes to that so um if you don't want them to do that for some reason like amazon warehouse deals and things like that if you don't want them to do that then you need to um just remove it and bring it back to your own warehouse, your own inventory and do what you want with it. Sell it on Facebook marketplace, sell it on eBay, sell it at a flea market, sell it at your garage sale, give it away, donate it, whatever you want to with it. But um, realize that if you dispose of it, you don't have to deal with the inventory, but then Amazon has the right to resell it or do what they want. I think um, the lines are a little fuzzy there, but I think it says they have the right to do what they want to with it. 
The other thing you need to do to improve your IPI score is to delete, close and delete old listings of products you don't plan on selling. Amazon's counting that against you right now. So if you have, you know, a hundred listings that were one-offs or books or, you know, anything that you sold that you're not selling again, go in, check your inventory and close and delete all those listings because that will improve your IPI score because they're looking at sell through. They're looking at, well, they don't know when you're going to replenish that or if you are. And so they're looking that as part of your inventory. So do that. Now, why is this good or bad? Is this a change that's good or bad? Number one, IPI scores and limitations have always existed, but why is this important now? Number one, they're enforcing it and they're going to encourage and limit how much you can send in if you have an IPI score. They want people to move product, bottom line. Their bottom line's at stake, so is yours. So what do you need to do about that? Um, you, you know, I think it's a good thing. I think this is good for us, why? Because it forces us to make better inventory decisions. It, causes us to break up with our old dead inventory that's just sitting there. It causes us to look into our stores, look at our SKUs, look at our inventory, and look at our numbers. So Amazon's saying, this has, you know, way, you're overstocked on this by a lot. You haven't sold a unit in, you know, two months and you maybe you didn't realize that. Maybe you have so many SKUs, you don't realize what's sitting there. So it kind of slaps you into reality of look at your inventory and remove it or we're going to charge you big dollars and we're going to limit what you can send in. What if you go to sit down tomorrow and you can't create a listing because Amazon told you you're at your maximum storage capacity for your store? That would be a bummer, wouldn't it? So now you got to break up with that old inventory. You can recover the cost of your dead inventory and move to more faster selling, more profitable inventory. It keeps you accountable for your slow moving items. And we all need that because honestly, how often do we look at some of these listings we've created a long time ago that are just kind of slow movers or they didn't really do well? I mean, those of us that have a lot more SKUs than that, it's easier to just ignore some of the you know, lower listings that aren't, you know, doing as much for you, but we need to be on top of it. So there's that. One more question someone had about IPI and the removals. Can you send in removed inventory back into Amazon and when? So there's a couple of, of rules about sending in removed inventory. Number one, remember, Amazon is doing this because they want you to sell inventory. They don't want it to sit there in storage forever. So they want you to move it. So after 90 days, if the number of units in stock falls below the 90 day sales numbers, you can send more in. So if example, if you have 10 units in stock and you only sell five during that 90 day period, you will not be allowed to send more inventory in. If you sell out, you can send at least that number of, of units in. So oftentimes more, they'll give you, you know, Right now, I think most of my, my limits for my storage, at least, are above 200 units per ASIN. So um, I don't, your results may vary. I think that varies by person, by store, by product, by category, I'm not sure. Um, but the rule is 90 days. You have to wait 90 days before you can send that back in. <clears throat> I tend to remove most, but not every unit, unless it's a listing I plan on you know, deleting completely. So if I have a slow mover, I'll remove most, maybe I'll keep two or three units there just to see. I'll revamp the listing and see what happens because if it sells through, they'll let you send more in. So just pay attention to that. Okay, so moving on to listing restrictions. Amazon has been enforcing new listing restrictions. And this is particularly specific to people doing bundling or uh, private label products or products that um, maybe are a GTIN uh, exemption type thing. So attempting to list a product that does not have a UPC code and a brand that matches together will give you an error code and will be prohibited. You will not be able to create a listing if you're naming a brand that doesn't match up with the UPC registered to that brand. So you cannot go and buy random UPC codes and try to list something under a brand that has their own UPC codes. So be aware of that. They are strictly enforcing this. I have tested this like 10 times. I have put Disney bundle in, created a fake listing, and then used a UPC code that did not match with Disney, and immediately it says, 
you do not have authorization to sell this brand or you're, you're trying, I don't have the exact error, error code memorized, but y'all have all seen it, I swear. It's, you know, the listing you're attempting to create, the UPC and brand doesn't match. Please check your numbers, try again. If you feel like you've gotten this code an error, then, um, you know, reach out to Seller Central. So that's something you need to be aware of, especially for bundlers. We'll get to more specific bundle issues in a second. If you decide you don't have a UPC code, you want to list bundles, if you apply for a GTIN exemption, yeah, attempt to list a bundle with other brand names, it's gonna give you the same error code. It's the same thing as using a UPC. Use it, your GTIN exemption does not exempt you from listing brands in your listing that are not in conjunction with a proper UPC code. They will recognize it. Hello, Autobots and auto algorithms and all those things will catch it. And so you won't be able to list those things. What can you do? What can you do? Number one, you can contact seller support if you feel like, you know, they says if you feel like you've reached this listing, you know, this code and error, your error code and error, you need to reach out to them. As soon as you reach out to them, they're going to ask you for images of your products and packaging. So if you're attempting to list a bundle on Amazon and you have named a brand or maybe you haven't and you're still getting this error code, they're going to ask you for products and packaging of those items. So you need to be aware that you need to produce images that say the brand name, that say exactly, because if it doesn't match, they're not gonna let the listing go through. So you need to be legitimate. They are trying to crack down on fraudulent things. They're trying to crack down on um, fake items that are being listed, you know, and things like that. And I know this, we're not really fake listing, you know, tarps and bungee cords, right? But like there's other things out there that are highly counterfeited and they want, they are trying to, from the top down, reduce the number of fraud issues and IP claims and counterfeit items that are coming through Amazon. And so this is one of the ways that they're enforcing that. You will not be allowed to save your listing if you attempt this. If you're trying to sell a coach bag under your own brand and your UPC and you name that brand in there somewhere, it's going to flag. So just pay attention to the wording that's in your listing. And if you have a legitimate concern, <clears throat> using the coach example that I just talked about, right? A coach bag. But if you're selling a you know miniature model of a stage coach and they block your listing because they think you're using the brand name coach, then you have a legitimate concern. You say, I'm not selling a coach bag. I don't know why my listing's being restricted, but here's this and that. They should be able to let you go through. But you know, sometimes like the word gift has been blocked by a lot of people's listings. But if you're selling a gift bag, you can't block the word gift. It's a gift bag that you're selling. So sometimes Amazon's algorithm, you know, blocks you for a reason that's really not your fault and then you need to reach out to them, but they're going to ask for pictures. They're going to ask for proof that you're selling what you say you're selling. So be ready to prove it because that burden of proof is on you. They don't have to let any listing go through that they don't want to. Remember, you're playing on their playground and they need to be, you need to be aware of that. So for all of us bundlers who are worried about brand names, if you're trying to sell brand names, what can you do instead? Use attributes to list your products, not brand names. What does this mean? That means if you're listing a newborn baby gift set, list the attributes, list the products that are involved and what it comes with rather than brand names. Just do that. So if you're listing a newborn baby gift set, list includes, um, you know, onesies, burp cloths, blankets, talk about the attributes of your item rather than what brand names they are. Because if you're trying to list Carter's and Gerber and some of these other brands that are out there and your UPC or your GTI exemption, it doesn't match those, you're going to get blocked and you're going to get frustrated. But if you show Amazon your pretty little box, of your custom packaging with your newborn baby gift set in it made by Kristen's favorite things and you show them all those things and then you have Gerber in your listing they're gonna be like well this isn't made by Gerber this is made by you so what's the problem here again Amazon says stuff about UPC codes so we're gonna talk about that as well because in their bundle policy I will quote it here it says you are responsible for obtaining a UPC code for each bundle you create this is the product bundling pro policy from Seller Central. I literally quoted that from there. You are responsible for obtaining a UPC for each bundle you create, a UPC or requesting a GTIN exemption. 
because you can't use the codes from somewhere else. Can you list brands and mix brands in a bundle? Yes, but their policy, yes, I know, brace yourself, right? Their policy conflicts with what they're rejecting right now. And it's like a David and Goliath thing. You feel like you're fighting City Hall, you're fighting you know, a giant when you try to say, your policy says I'm allowed to do this, yet you're requiring me to use a UPC and I must obtain a new UPC, but I can't use a UPC from any of the companies listed here. So there's, it's like a catch-22. There's nothing you can do about it except for not name the brands, or you can contact Carter's or Gerber or the brands you're asked and ask them for a unique UPC code to brand the items there, which they're highly unlikely to give you because you are combining their item with somebody else and they don't want their brand on somebody else's brand. So you have issues there, right? So if there's no valid code that you have for that, you can request a GTIN exemption. That means you have to list it under your brand name, get the GTI and exemption in your own brand name that you're going to create. What do you need to do about that? Right now, in their policy statements, they say two things, but they're actually requiring both, even though it says you need this or this, they're now requiring both. So here's what you need to do to get a GTI and exemption right now. You need a letter from the brand saying that they do not provide a GTIN, a global trade in index number. They don't provide a number and the reason. So I'm Kristen's favorite things. I have products to sell and I do not offer a GTIN number and the reason. So you need to state the reason. The reason is I create multiple customized um, bundle packs and seasonal quantities and they're different all of them are different and it's not cost effective to put a UPC code on every single multiple different customized bundle that I make. So therefore, I don't provide those for my company and this is the reason why. I don't know that they care about the reason why, they just need it on file perhaps. So this is things like if you custom make blankets, if you custom make anything, if you're a private labeler and your products don't have barcodes on them because you're white labeling, private labeling, whatever else, I don't think the reason matters. They're just requesting one and you have to give them one. It should be on an official letter from the brand, Kristen's favorite things, writing the letter on behalf of the seller, also myself, um, that says that this is the reason why I don't provide it. I'm giving permission. Also says that there are two, there are a minimum of two images of the product and the packaging of the product. They used to just say either or, but now they want both. And they're not, they didn't change their policy. This is just what they're enforcing when someone says, hey, I'm requesting a GTI and exemption. They're like, okay, great. We got your letter and they even give you a template for the letter. If you go to Amazon Seller Central and go to GT on exemption, they'll give you the template for the letter. But then this is also in our wholesale bundles course. You can get the GTIN template letter there as well and an explanation of kind of how to do this. But now they're actually requiring custom packaging um, or packaging with your brand name on it. So if Kristen's favorite things is filing for a GTIN exemption and I've got this cute little newborn baby gift set in a box with my label or logo or name on the packaging, that's going to be accepted. They want legitimate brands. And whether or not you're a legitimate brand or care about being one because you're just bundling stuff that already exists, that's no problem. But you still have to comply to the rules or they're gonna say no to you. And then you've worked all this for in vain. Do you have to be brand registered to do that? Not yet. But eventually, I feel like that's gonna be the way Amazon, I've been saying this for over a year. Eventually, Amazon's going to require everyone to have brand registry at some point. Just be aware of that. Just tuck that in the back of your mind somewhere, even if you're not ready to be brand registered or pick a brand or you could care less about branding because you're just trying to create bundles to make money. Guys, I get it. I understand. But nothing that's worth doing is easy or fast or cheap. So just remember that in business. This isn't, you know, uh, just a, your yard sale that you're selling, you're setting up. This isn't Facebook marketplace where you can sell pretty much anything that you want, anywhere you want. This isn't eBay where you can sell used and new and old and all this vintage stuff. This is a different entity. And if you want to play, if you want to run with the big dogs on Amazon, you're going, you have to get with the program. You know, it's going to cost you some time, some money, some energy, some effort, but I got to tell you, it's worth it in the long run. I don't mess with UPC codes. I don't mess with any of these things. However, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a trick here in just a second. 
which has saved thousands and thousands of dollars and might help you out a lot if you don't want to deal with GTI exemptions or brand registry. So I will give you that tip coming up. Here's the thing. Be legitimate in your business. This is a business. It is not a hobby unless you want it to be a hobby and then you're just a hobby. The difference, in case you didn't know, is a business makes you money, a hobby costs you money. Even if you're breaking even, you only have an expensive hobby. Breaking even is not profitable. If you're in business, you're in business to make a profit. If you're not making a profit, you just have a really expensive hobby. That's it. You need to make money. In order to do that, you're going to have to invest. Takes money to make money, right? This doesn't start for free. This isn't, you know, you can start cheap. Yes, that's true. You can start bare minimum. So don't get discouraged if you feel like you have to have all of these things at the very beginning. You can still start with a uh, personal seller account, sell used books on Amazon, sell some things that aren't restricted, things like that. You can get started on the cheap. And I, I, I venture to say easy but I don't want to say easy. I want to say there's a process. It's not complicated, but there is a process to be able to become verified as an Amazon seller and start getting products in there. If you're new and you want to know more about that, mommyincome.com slash start or um, startfbatoday.com is the beginner course for Amazon. So when you do that, you ha you're a legitimate business. So it's going to cost you time, money, or both. And so depending on what you want, I'm in this for the long game. I want to sell on Amazon as long as they'll allow, as long as um, I decide I want to sell on Amazon. For right now, for the foreseeable future, I make a really decent living on Amazon and I want to continue that. So I'm taking the steps necessary to protect my account, my brand, my, um, my income. This is our main income in our household. And so I need to protect that. And what do I need to do? Well, we brand register. Brand registry requires a trademark. To get a trademark from the US government, it takes nine to 12 months. And if you have problems, it can take longer. But our lovely friends at Amazon have partnered with some uh, trademark lawyers and the IP accelerator program has gotten people brand registry and in the door within two to four weeks after filing. They help you with your trademark, they let you know what's going on and because they work directly with Amazon as private uh, lawyer and uh, attorney firms, they work with Amazon, but because Amazon has chosen them or worked with them, they will allow your brand registry to go through before your trademark. So it gives you a competitive advantage. You don't have to wait nine to 12 months before you register your brand. Even if your brand is ABC, you know, instruments, whatever it is, I don't know, ABC general store. I don't care what it is. Um, just the idea that you're registering that brand so that you can use that brand to sell whatever you want on Amazon, period. It's just a, a good idea to be able to get. And then you have a trademark. You have a US trademark that you can do whatever you want with. That's a great thing to have. It's just a little bit expensive. If you do the IP accelerator program, you can also do it yourself and get a trademark, but you might run into problems. And you, if you can't read legalese, good luck with that. I've filed two trademarks now, one on my own, which we actually went through and just fine. And a second one I've had problems with. So I've had to hire an attorney. I did it myself again the second time, but there were more problems with the second trademark. So we're in the, I'm in the middle of using a lawyer for that. No problem. But still, you know, it costs time and money. In the long run, invest in the long term. This is not short term, quick cash, pay my rent this month kind of business. This is the long game. Can you make that money that fast? Sure you can. But you have to think about the long game. This isn't a get rich quick, get in and get out and make your millions. That's not how it works. And so if that's what you were in for, just take a deep breath and start over because that's not what's going to happen. So Amazon wants you to have these things. They want you to have a legitimate business. They want you to show custom packaging and showing that this is your brand. So here's another tip. We have a whole training on custom packaging. You can look at uh, mommyincome.com slash custom and you can see the custom packaging training. We talk about all the different rules and regulations and where you can go to get custom packaging made and what kind of files you're gonna need and all the specs and all of what Amazon has told us, which is very minimum, about what they accept about custom packaging. But I also have a shortcut for that. to make custom packaging for your Amazon, um, Amazon products, whether you're, you're making bundles or you've got a private label or anything like that, there are a few quick steps that you can do to make custom packaging fast and easy. Number one is 
if you don't have a logo, you need to create a logo. So you're going to have to have some sort of logo. And does Amazon require a logo? No, but it's more legitimate in their opinion. Most companies have some sort of logo, some sort of branding that sets them apart from someone else. So the reality there is that Amazon is going to want to, um, enforce that. They want you to see that you spent the time and the money to be a legitimate professional company and a professional brand. So even though that might not be your goal to be a household name, they still want you to comply to whatever other branding is doing. So a fast and easy way to get a logo made is to hire someone on Fiverr. Go to mommyincome.com slash Fiverr, F-I-V-V-E-R, and hire someone to create a logo for you. And what you can do is just Take some Google images of some other logos that you like, even if your name is Kristen's favorite things, and look at other logos out there and say, I like these colors, I like these things, this is my brand name, create me some logos. The most good designers for $5, $10, maybe $20, will give you two or three different logos to choose from. And you can pick one or all of those that will give you the vector files. They will give you the files that you need. And for 20 bucks and usually a two day turnaround, I got a logo made in two days on Fiverr and they gave me six choices. I picked one that I loved, but they gave me six options. I was super thrilled with that. So mommyincome.com slash Fiverr, F-I-V-V-E-R. And you can go to that link and pick, um, I think that gives you, um, It'll give you a link to specific pages. Pick graphic designers, logo designers, type that in and figure someone out. Then you have your logo. So you take that logo and you go to Sticker Mule, mommyincome.com slash Sticker Mule. I love Sticker Mule, by the way. They also send me cute stickers all the time because I love them. Um, yes, that's an affiliate link. $10 free for you, $10 free for me, mommyincome.com slash Sticker Mule. What will Sticker Mule do for you for custom packaging? Look, I had this poly bag made. I got it in eight days. I already had my logo. I uploaded it. And for, it's not the cheapest necessarily, but for eight, if in eight days, I got this delivered to my door, a hundred of these bad boys with my logo on it, with whatever I want on it. And this is custom packaging. It's printed directly on the packaging, which is what Amazon wants. They don't want you to create a sticker and stick that on a box. They're not accepting that right now, even though I feel like they should. Um, they're not accepting that. They want it printed directly on the packaging as, just as much as you would see. Um, I don't know, like this is like printed right directly on here. They have a barcode information, stuff like that. So they want this. You can also have on the back of it printed your company name in the corner or somewhere else. They will do, I think they will do both sides or you can have it on the same side that says manufactured by Kristen's favorite things, you know, Orion, Michigan, you know, whatever, a website, something, a barcode. They will even put those things on there for you. Sticker Mule, mommyincome.com slash sticker mule. And they also really give you some fun free gifts as well. They'll send you some extra stickers. I even got like a bottle of mule sauce. It's like this hot sauce they send you. It's great um, if you like heat. Get your custom packaging. So you go get your logo on Fiverr, mommyincome.com slash Fiverr, and get your custom poly bags. I think they have two or three sizes and they will customize if you reach out to them. And get your logo made, get this stuff printed. You can have custom packaging in less than 10 days. So if you're freaking out about my GTI and exemption and I have to prove that I own this and they wanna see custom packaging and it has to be this or that, this is what you want. You want custom packaging quick and easy. So in about a week, you can get your own custom packaging and comply to Amazon's GTIN slash brand registry, whatever rules and become a little bit more legitimate. And plus you get pretty little new um, packaging. So for more information about that, go to mommyincome.com slash sticker mule to get that mommyincome.com slash Fiverr to get your logo made. And if you want the custom package training to understand all the things you need, mommyincome.com slash custom. All right. This is the last and final trick that I want to teach you that has saved, that has saved thousands. I just tried this myself. I don't need to try this. I tried it for you guys because I want to be able to get you guys to save money, to get rid of some of these crazy headaches that you're going through. If you're not ready for brand registry yet, or if your trademark is pending, or you're not sure what you're doing, or you're brand new, whatever it is, there, uh, there is a less expensive way to get a GTIN. A GTIN, again, is a global 
trade index number. It is a UPC or an EAN or a, a couple other forms, ISBN number or whatever else. So if you're selling product and you need a UPC code or you need a GTIN number and you don't want to deal with the, ex ex the exemptions and brand registry right now, you need to get EIN number, EAN numbers. EAN numbers are the European numbers instead of the UPC that is used in North America. Here's the fundamental difference, cost. So I just went to gs1uk.org and I got 1,000 EAN 13 digit numbers accepted by Amazon on products for 150 US dollars. If you go to gs1.org for the US, you can get 100 codes, I think for $250 and then there's an annual renewal fee. EAN numbers, are just plain less expensive. And you can use them on amazon.com. You do not have to be a European company. You do not have to be based in the UK. I filled out the form and it said, you know, what is your VAT number? Oh, I don't have, I'm not registered as a VAT text. My, my, my country didn't come up on their list. They let me register all the way through. I got through it, I made my payment, and then I got my code. And in the code, you list the product you need to, in order to get the code, you need to list the product name and a, a description of it and a couple other pieces of information. And after you're done with that, bam, it gives you the code. You take that code, you create your listing on Amazon using an EAN number, and bam, all done. It's awesome and way cheaper. So make sure that if you need an EAN number, or you need a UPC, you need a GTIN, whatever it is that you need, and you want to circumvent all the other craziness, and you want to deal with brand registry right now and all those things, get your own EAN numbers. You will need to list your company's name and you know, your, your typical stuff, and then they give you your registered code. It is amazing. I'm not sure why EAN numbers are this much cheaper than UPC codes, but who cares? You can also get a barcode with it, the barcodes, they give you three free, I think, and then you have to pay for the actual visual, you know, code that looks like this. Um, you will have to actually pay extra for those after three, but some of them you don't need a code on it. You just need the number. And if Amazon wants you to prove it, then you can have that. You can print it on your packaging if you need to, whatever else you need to do. But for now, you can list that item with your EAN number and not have to even worry about the actual UPC code, you just need that number, it can save you thousands of dollars and a lot of headaches. So make sure that you do that. It's a cheap, fast, easy way to get your items listed on Amazon with absolute 100% legitimate EAN registered codes to your business. I recommend that highly to get, you know, if you don't wanna go through all the rigmarole, but I still highly recommend creating a brand, getting brand registry, getting that trademark, because it will save your business in the long run. And you guys, no, you don't have to commit to the long run all the time. You can start small and start building up to that because you never know what Amazon's gonna change next. I do believe they're going to start forcing brand registry because it's a good solid protection for everyone involved. And it has awesome, features once you brand register. There are so many features behind the brand registry cloud that I just, you know, I can't say enough about how much brand registry has meant to me and my business and the growth of it. So that's just me. If you're not there yet, fine. Go get some EAN numbers. GS1UK.org. So thank you so much for listening to this episode again, maybe re rewind it, listen to it again, watch it again, write some of these things down, take some action on your IPI score, take some action on an EAN number or GTIN exemption, get rid of some dead inventory and take a deep breath knowing that Amazon has moved a couple steps closer to being more of a third party supporter. I know in the past we haven't felt as if Amazon gave a rip about us as third party sellers, but as these numbers increase, as their lawsuits increase, they're realizing how important it is to take care of us who are selling products on their platform to the tune of 68% of their total sales. Hello, that is craziness. For more information or to read those articles, you can go to the Seller Central page and go to your news bulletin areas or you know the news updates. And the other article I mentioned with all these crazy facts is bloomberglaw.com. That's the one that talks about all the antitrust lawsuits and things like that. So you can always fact check all those things there. And 
you know, just happy selling on Amazon. You guys hang in there. These are good changes. They're annoying some of them, but it also forces us to be more legitimate and more accountable, which will also increase our bottom line. So cheers to Amazon selling. I'm still all about this. Don't forget about the Q4 Jumpstart class, mommyincome.com slash jumpstart. I will see you same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files.